Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Gallery X virtual opening of the exhibit by Phil Bergerson, curated by Matt Waffles. We're very excited to have you all here and very excited about this evening and uh, hearing all about uh, Phil, his, um, his, his uh, inspirations, his thoughts. His, uh, this is going to be quite uh, an amazing evening. Uh, you'll you'll uh, be so pleased that you've come. Uh, this is our third uh, exhibition at Gallery X. The first one was uh, an international exhibition between uh, the Canadian Society of Painters in Watercolor and the National Watercolor Society of uh, the United States. The second exhibition was uh, an exclusive group uh, called The Ford. Now, both of these exhibitions you'll be able to see on the website and uh, go on and, and have a look. I think you'll, you'll enjoy those as well. But uh, putting, the sh putting shows together like this, there's so much that goes on in the background. And uh, when, when it comes to, um, you know, uh, to, the, to my spot, and by the way, my name is Rain Tunley, and I'm the exhibition chair here at uh, Gallery X. And so when it comes to, to my end, uh, there, there's going over the material, making sure that it's, it's going to be uh, delivered the way that uh, the artist would like to see it delivered, and uh, also the way the gallery would like to see it delivered. Uh, this, um, this evening is going to be quite exciting. We're going to be starting uh, with Rox. Rox is our moderator, and she will go over some of the, uh, the Zoom etiquette and what to expect with Zoom. She will introduce Tim Petru. Tim is our interim chair at uh, Gallery X. And uh, Tim will speak a little bit about Gallery X and, uh, about, and introduce you to Phil Bergerson. So um, now, Rox, I'm going to pass the torch over to you. Thank and you thank so you. Much. Um, it is my great pleasure to be moderating this evening. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. If you would like to rename yourself uh, to, to something that your name is not currently, you can hover your mouse over your face, click on the three dots in the upper right, and then click rename. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, then keep your camera off. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, you can put them in the chat. Um, as Phil's slides that he's going to be talking about are, are timed, um, it, it would really help us out if you not uh, talk while he's presenting. Uh, if you put your questions in the chat, we'll find a, find a good place to put them. And that's just about it from me. Now, in the event that somebody accidentally unmutes themselves and starts making all sorts of racket, then I will sneak in and mute you to help out. Um, I shall pass it over to our interim chair. Thank you, Rox, and thank you, Rain. Um, so I, I'm going to try and keep it brief because I'm much more excited to hear about what uh, Phil and Matt have to say as the show goes on. Um, but uh, some thoughts maybe to uh, kick it off. Um, the curatorial statement was, you know, uh, striking, uh, I'll say. And there's uh, two, two pieces of the Baudrillard quote uh, that, you know, uh, I, I took as a sort of guide while I was uh, exploring the uh, images um, for this exhibition and this idea of America being this um, perfect simulacrum and uh, Americans being this simulation. Um, well, it, 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 it's to me interesting that we have this uh, very uh, rich body of work um, where we can look at the relationships between uh, the symbols and reality and sort of um, what that means and uh, it underlying our vision as a gallery, um, we, we, the, the X in Gallery X is um, meant to uh, connote ex this uh, existential uh, question. And um, what, what we set out to do is to look at spaces and voids through um, art and 
to seek out significance and meaning um, in what we're uh, taking in, uh, visually or otherwise. And then uh, it, it sort of uh, it, it gives us a little bit of attention to explore. And what, the, what this uh, exhibition, I, I'm sure you'll come to see, uh, it, 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 it's well suited um, to giving you this sort of, uh, I don't want to say anxiety, but this, this uh, to, to exposing us to this tension of these uh, ideas that are um, uh, performed uh, by quote unquote America. And, um, you know, underlying it, this sort of a hollowness or a, a shallow feel uh, that allows us to untether from the depicted reality and really sort of um, fill some of that space with what these meanings and images um, mean to us, what they signify to the viewer. Um, so uh, if that is at all <laughs> sort of a way to sort of help kick this off, um, it, it is, this is how I have personally uh, took in um, some of this work uh, as a preview. Um, I don't want to take up any more time. I'll pass it over to uh, Phil uh, to now tell us really about these things and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you again. Thank you, Tim. Um... I'm on, I take it. So uh, thank you, Rain, and thank you, Tim, and thank you, uh, Peter Marsh, and the rest of the board for giving me this, uh, or us, the opportunity, Matt and I. And uh, thanks to Hendrik and Tim. I think the two of you worked on getting all of this up on the web. Uh, and a special thanks to Rox, if she keeps this all in line, though. I'll get you afterwards if you don't, Rox. Um, this has been an incredible year for me with a beautiful retrospective book just out on my 50 year career and a comprehensive, beautiful exhibition at the Stephen Bolger Gallery. And uh, of course I lost track of how many times the exhibition opened and closed at Stephen Bolger's. But Stephen hung in there uh, with me and I, I think it came close to getting a Guinness uh, world record for the longest running exhibition that nobody saw. So it's been quite a year and a half and uh, I'm almost sick of hearing myself talk about myself. And uh, my close friends who are watching tonight, as I saw them trickling in, they're probably sick of hearing me also, but I know what they're doing. They are probably muting this so they don't have to listen to me. They're just here thanking me, but I'm gonna get rocks to check in to make sure that all of my friends aren't muting what they're, uh, what I'm saying. Um, anyway, for all the rest of you, I'll try to be as fascinating as possible in this context. It's very, uh, very difficult. Um, I'd like to dedicate, well, I was a teacher for 33 years at Ryerson. I think of teaching as another medium of choice, uh, just uh, equal to uh, what I do with photography. I really enjoy the act of uh, teaching and organizing what I was doing, being creative about it, etc. cetera. Uh, but I quit a little early in order to uh, do my own books and it's worked out pretty well. So I, I taught at Ryerson for 33 years and I enjoyed uh, almost every minute of it, especially with the kids. So tonight, uh, knowing what's happening to teachers across the world, but especially here in Toronto, um, they're really getting beaten up by uh, what they're trying to do, standing on their heads. So tonight I'd like to dedicate this lecture, lecture to teachers, teachers who inspire their students every single day. You are all, you all deserve medals, especially those teaching our youngest children, children during this pandemic. Bravo to you all. So I knew that, uh, I realized that a number of you don't know me uh, and probably don't know my work either. So let me just give you a little background. At, uh, right at this juncture, I'd just like to, uh, I especially want to address this uh, idea of opportunity 
uh, to the young artists in the audience. They have really been hammered during this pandemic. I would like to give you this advice. Take advantage of the opportunities around you, especially when you think that there are none. Make your own opportunities. Make the opportunities into more than anyone else thought they could be. Take the sliver of wood and grow a tree. Oh, isn't that a lovely one? Uh, I've tried to do that my whole life by organizing lecture series, conferences, exhibitions, student study trips to Europe, China, and Japan, and creating books. Many opportunities flowed directly from them. They didn't exist until I saw the opportunity to create them. I believe you can do the same. And now here I am with an opportunity to exhibit in another gallery, a gallery that doesn't even exist. How cool is that? This is, my, this is a first for me. I'm in a gallery with no brick or mortar. In a gallery idea held together by a group of people who are working well beyond their norm, I'm sure. Exhausting themselves to make something wonderful for others in the future. They are all to be congratulated. I'm glad to be a part of its beginning, but more importantly, I've taken it on as a challenging opportunity, another opportunity. For me, the aging artist, and Matt, the young artist, teacher, and now curator, he has done the same. I say aging, aging affectionately. I wanna be like Imogene Cunningham, a great photographer who I, wanted to come to Ryerson to speak. She was 92. I'll just uh, read what happened between us. After 20 rings, remember she's 92. After 20 rings, she picked up the phone, apologizing that she was struck or stuck in her darkroom washing prints. Imogene Cunningham was 92. Warm and friendly, she said she would love to speak in Canada, but the trip would be too difficult. She ended the call by explaining that she didn't talk to students. She talked with them. The next day, I wasn't surprised to see her on The Tonight Show, receiving first prize for decorating blue jean jackets. I want to be like Imogene Cunningham when I'm 92. I took this uh, exhibition as an opportunity to try to present some new thoughts and some old things in some new ways. It has challenged me to think about what I have to say and how I could say it. So here I am. By the way, I wanna thank you all for coming wherever you are out there. Who are you? Why are you here? in all the different ways that this can be taken. Where are you from and where are you going? Are you doing something that makes you happy? What involvement in what makes you happy? Remember the question later when I quote Salman Rushdie about happiness. I'm just asking, let me introduce myself a little more. I am an artist. It took me 50 years to get comfortable with calling myself that. I never took it lightly. I knew it had to be earned through a rigorous investment of time and energy. I remember fondly that first day at Ryerson as a photography student when I was 18. Just after telling the director I wanted to be an artist using photography, he informed me that I was in the wrong school. How wrong he was. Ryerson was a perfect fit for me. It was an excellent school where we learned the critical tools required to examine and discuss almost anything intelligently. 
Through the late 60s and 70s, I explored a variety of mediums like film, photography, painting, and printmaking, but finally snuggled up with photography as my medium of choice. I was 20 years teaching others before I confronted myself and made some dramatic changes in my approach to photography that allowed me to grow into that altered state of being an artist. Through the 70s and 80s, after 30 years of art production, I finally found my subject. It was America, the culture of the United States. And after working on this subject for about five years, I made a creative breakthrough by beginning to discover the various themes and ideas that allowed me to surge forward as an artist and themes I am still pursuing today. It was stunning for me. I began to be able to speak insightfully about the world around me. I think to be an artist, one has to develop the ability to tackle the complex challenging or challenge of trying to make sense of the world. By the end, by the mid 1990s, I felt I had arrived. I began accepting myself as an artist and no amount of sales or lack of sales or exhibitions or lack of exhibitions or grants or lack of same and no amount of negative or positive criticism can take that away from you because you have arrived. After 15 years of working on America, I realized that, lear that learning how to make books of sequences was the essential final ingredient that would allow me to express what I was experiencing in the field. Let's look at the title of this exhibit for a moment. What on earth are you doing? I made the photograph of this sign out in the middle of nowhere. And we've included it in this exhibition. What on earth are you doing? What on earth are you doing? Perhaps that one line could have been the whole lecture. What on earth are you doing? Perhaps later, we could slowly turn the large megaphone we use to shout this question through. And we could slowly turn it to face south and blast out what on earth are you doing? What on earth are you doing? In a few minutes, I'm going to show you the Gallery X, the Gallery X exhibition in sequence. I'll play a 15 minute slideshow with 15 second intervals between each slide. You'll see the whole exhibit. I'll have a voice over, uh, but it won't be in sync and it'll be talking about some other things. So it, it's gonna take some getting used to and uh, a little bit of work. I'll be presenting a variety of ideas and experiences. In the early nineties, once I found my subject matter, a series of themes began to emerge from the hundreds of photographs I was making and layers of meaning began to build. The book form was the essential vehicle I needed to advance the meaning within the work. My first two books were Shards of America, 2004, with a wonderful essay by David Harris. My second book was American Artifacts, 2014, essays by Margaret Atwood and Nathan Lyons. I still don't know why these people accepted collaborating with me, especially when Margaret Atwood asked me to edit the work that I wanted to use of hers. That's, that's scary, I didn't sleep that night. My first two books reflect an America simmering through the last decade of the 20th century into the first two decades of the 21st. Each book reflects a span of time when political and financial turmoil in conjunction with terrorist deeds and threats sent the economy and social structures into chaos. 
The impact of these events trickled down to a population that was poorly positioned to respond well, leaving especially the most vulnerable in a state of anger and confusion. Now, rather than focusing on specific examples of this turmoil, I chose to photograph the trace residue of these struggles. The trace residues. Complex message fragments, both literal and metaphorical, expressing intimate thoughts and secrets about this vibrant, troubled society. My latest book is a collaboration with uh, between myself, Peter Higdon, one of the writers, and Don Snyder, another writer. When they came to me to, saying they would like to do this, uh, it is, it's strange. Having a retrospective book produced about your career, it's incredibly humbling terrifying and fulfilling all at once. I recommend this book to anybody who wants to live through their own trajectory of life from the time you were a student to the time you are now, because the book is set up that way. And we try to gear it so that while you're reading about my trajectory and my experiences, it makes you think of your own. And I think it's very open to that. And especially as you have early photographs that I've made when I was you know, 18, 19 in New York City uh, as a student. So I heartily recommend it to you. That's it on the screen right now. Rox, you're doing good. I'm forgetting to cue, cue you. This has been a humbling experience especially humbling is that it's a 50 year retrospective of my work over the past 50 years of my career. And I'm still alive. It, you're usually dead. Especially humbling is that I'm still alive. And these people made a retrospective of me. And fortunately, I'm still alive to enjoy it. Did I already say I'm still alive? Let's look at a couple of photographs. Photographing abandoned store windows gave me my first clues, my first insight into this culture. Child mannequins, stork. As a counterpoint to all this, let's look at an early photograph I took in 1998. Uh, sorry, this, sorry, uh, just go back, I'm sorry. Uh, that, is the, that is the one from 1998. Swirling around this window is a beautiful sense of nostalgia for a simpler time. It triggers thoughts about the American dream, romantic notions of life and children and fairy tales and escapism, and naivete and naive and warmly human. Here's my experience making it. Child mannequins, slightly damaged, simply dressed, and surrounded by old Christmas lights, set off against ancient fixtures and a stork conjuring up fairy tale notions. The window display read as an elegant representation of a less complicated, gentler, more naive time. The store was closed, but I knew I wanted this photograph. I knew I was gonna use this photograph. The store was closed, so I looked next door for help. Squeezing through the doorway into the overcrowded little store, I encountered a group of six elderly women sitting around a worn card table, still wearing coats and hats. They balanced on the edges of small folding chairs and drank tea from china cups. I asked if anyone knew the owner of the adjacent store, presuming that person was in that room. Everyone seemed startled. But finally, a woman in an elaborate red hat with blue feathers explained that the woman had died two days earlier. I had stumbled into a wake, a tea party in her honor. I apologized for my intrusion, but had to ask, would she have minded if someone photographed her window? 
they were still uneasy about answering. But when I suggested that she would probably have loved having someone so appreciative of her creation, they all cheered in agreement, stood up and raised their cups in her memory. It conjures up what Rushdie said about the right to be happy. I quoted him at the beginning of my first book. He said, one of the things that I've always admired about the United States is that this is a country which declares its independence by stating that its citizens have the right to the pursuit of happiness. He continued, there isn't another country in the world which declared independence on the basis that people should be happy. As soon as I heard this quote, I knew it would provide a beautiful, ironic entry into my first book. Irony is everywhere I look in America. Things say one thing, but mean another. The isolation that comes with COVID has made many of us confront whether we are happy or not. What makes us happy? What makes you happy? What makes an American happy? And is there some representation of it that I can find? Is it tied up in the American dream? The American dream. In summary, the American dream states that anyone can become president. We learned that too well. And the next generation will be better off than the last. And I think the pursuit of happiness is integral to the pursuit of the American dream. But determining what makes you happy can really distort the way you conduct your life. That seems to be where the problems arise. Why there are so many in need of psychologists and financial analysts Half the people move towards the pursuit of an interesting life, while the other half gets caught up with pursuing consumerism with a vengeance, needing things, more and more things. Now we aren't immune from that in Canada either, but I find so many representations of all of that in the States. And you know the romantic notion of the road trip? I'm kind of on the road trip part of the uh, American dream like for the last 20 years. That is, people want to get a job, get a house, get a car, and then they want to escape their house and their living situation and get on the road and go uh, on the freedom of the open road. The streets of America fascinate me. It is here I have discovered signs that speak about all manner of cultural and social issues, eloquently conveying the hopes, desires, and fears of their makers. It is in the street that Americans reveal a unique, often cocky confidence that sets them apart from most of their Canadian neighbors. Treasuring their freedom of speech, they pride themselves on their right to say what's on their minds. So many Americans seem to have no qualms about expressing even their most private feelings and thoughts publicly. I've been drawn in, seduced in fact, by this American bravado and the resulting message shards. I have the next slide. A man named Tony has closed his shop. He puts up a sign apologizing for the inconvenience of his heart surgery. Such apologies are leftovers from a simpler time, a time when everyone apologized for everything. Unlike now, when few people apologize for anything. In this archeological site, Tony's sign reflects the existence of a gentler kind of people perhaps even a gentler full layer of this multifaceted society. But as with so many of my discoveries, 
there is often a counterpoint of conflicting contrasting elements juxtaposed to Tony's sign as a dramatically posed lion attacking his prey with deadly force. And who killed and stuffed them? There is a struggle here between competing value systems. And in America, collisions of opposing value systems often occur. This dramatic interplay creates challenging choices for its citizens to make. I was going, uh, Rox, I was going to say bring the camera back to me, uh, but uh, everyone is seeing me right now, are they? <laughs> I've got you, uh, I've got you pinned so they should be able to see you. I'm on side. Okay, I hate to leave the single picture up for so long, but anyway, that's fine. Um, by the way, these photographs I'm showing you right now are not in the exhibit. I'm using them to make some points and uh, I'm going to uh, soon show you a photograph which is about 10 more than the ones you're just looking at just to see the uh, the difference in them i have been crisscrossing the united states for over 20 years now traveling through hundreds of its smallest towns and largest cities photographically investigating the america social landscape i usually go out on the road shooting for two or three weeks at a time I drive in endless circles all day long. The driving being broken up by hours of walking up and down endless numbers of streets, looking and searching. I'm looking beneath the surface of things to find some personal expression of someone's life experience in America, a shard they have left behind either knowingly or not. My photographs have no people in them, but they are all about people. They're about the people who have made or displayed or altered or collected those things I photograph. They speak about the human condition. Come with me and follow me into the streets. Walk with me a little through the streets I pass through. Climbing down from my camper van into the streets of a hundred towns across the country, walking slowly and searching with the mindset of the archeologist. I search for evidence of life, shards of a culture in turmoil. What is this culture all about? What do its people think about, laugh about, cry about? There are no real people on this walk. I block them out. There are only artifacts, things that seem foreign, yet familiar, even mysterious in their familiarity. In my mind, I'm at ground level in the midst of some ancient civilization, sifting through its remains, searching out and collecting only those artifacts that provide evidence of their maker's personality and concerns. Here these shards of messages often reveal more than their makers intended. My first two books were called Shards of America and American Artifacts. And I use the word shards and artifacts in the titles to reference the archeological dig. I know I don't have the skills or training of the archeologist, but I assume the persona of one while working. It's like putting a filter on to view what is beneath the surface. But I assume the, per, per, uh, I find it gives me, uh, sorry, I assume the persona of one while working. I find it gives me a certain intellectual edge which helps me with the process of looking, helping me push forward the act of looking, pushing forward the act of looking toward the more important act of seeing. <laughs> Got some great things going on with my notes. Well, like the archaeologist with her pottery shards, I try to piece together my shards. In my case, it's within sequences of images, placing one against the other, trying to make sense of them, the one in relation to the other. Sequencing, relationships, themes, meaning, 
This is the most important process in my methodology. That is the act of sequencing, constructing fragments into meaningful relationships that ex through extended sequences. After selecting representatives of the various themes, I weave them into the fabric of the overall sequence, producing a complex representation of this vibrant, troubled society. Eureka moments do happen once or twice per trip, but usually my photography is a slow plodding discovery process. It is a kind of discovery process that takes time to absorb. Walking the streets, on the scene, looking at a display you happened upon in a tiny town you never expected to be in, you know there's something there, but you can't quite read it. But you stay there, looking harder and harder, and through your gaze, the relationships slowly become clear, and suddenly you can see them. You, you then begin to figure out how to photograph those relationships, subtly shifting your focus, vantage point, framing, depth of field, etc., until all is clear. You execute the photograph that makes what you saw readable to others. Uh, can I have the next slide now, Rox? So 10 years later, I made this photograph. It actually ended up being the, um, the cover of my second book. I was in a town, I took the wrong turn, went out in the boonies around this town and lo and behold, this occurred. I was terrified because I couldn't believe how many things are in this picture, how many things were coming together on the scene. I was terrified that a little man was gonna come around the outside and say, get the hell out of here, or you can't photograph here or whatever. So as quickly as possible, I kept moving and moving and moving, trying to position myself in just the right place to make this photograph. Now, if you look at the two first photographs, they're fairly simple in their structure. Uh, and uh, the framing was relatively easy. Um, the, uh, this one, uh, occurred one, because I allowed myself to get lost. I didn't worry about getting lost. And I was able to harness the complexity. Rarely do so many things come together so quickly in one picture and so perfectly. It's about telling visually, visually telling Pocatello, Idaho, 2007. A dumpster, a mattress with a stain representing life and death. You have cars perched on these train cars as if they're trophies. You have the train car in which it represents so often the case that we need nature no matter where we are. Even if we have steel around us, we want to cover it in some way because we need that natural element. And as you go back, the cement factory and its beautiful kind of presence against the quality of the foreground cars, um, hubs, and the color of the car, and the color of the second car. If the two cars were reversed, the picture would fall apart. And that little slice of red in the middle of the photograph that carries forward and back into the car. And as you keep on looking, you see that there are mountains behind that reflect a similarity to what is being pictured. And lo and behold, on the top of the cement factory is a flag, American flag. Um, this doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, you know, and you stop and you make it. And no one said I couldn't photograph there. In fact, they were delighted I was there. Now, we're going to now look at the exhibit. 
Um, my intro now takes a slight turn towards a more impressionistic sense of what I do. It comes to in the form of a slideshow with my voice over, but that is all be speaking about various things while the slides are going on, but it's not in sync. In other words, just as I have now done, talked about the particular photographs. Now when the exhibition occurs uh, now in a slide show, I won't be addressing the individual photographs, but I'll be talking about another thing. So there's two things going on and uh, it's up to you to put together what you can. I wanna give you a flavor, a taste of what I do, an impressionistic view of what I do and how I work and what I think about, think about what I'm doing. Okay, we'll start the slides. My street experiences. With black cloth in hand, I run back to my camera set up in front of the hardware store's window. Suddenly, a young man appears out the side door of this aging building. His clothes convey a carefully crafted sense of coolness, his gestures an arrogance. He is intrigued by my presence and decides to engage. Half playing with me, he says, hey, want to buy some drugs? Uh, no, thanks. A girl, maybe. No, thanks. How about a gun? I recognize the snare that's coming, so I deflect. No, no thanks, but do you mind helping me hold up this dark cloth? I'm trying to cut out these reflections. He's interested. After examining his reflection in the window, he's hooked. Uh, yeah, that, that's cool, I got a minute. How high do you want it? As he raises his arm and my cloth in front of the camera, I see a pistol slowly stepping out of the inside pocket of his jacket. With his free hand, he nonchalantly pushes it back in play, place and repositions the dark cloth perfectly. How's that, he says. Another day. Usually the early morning light is so low it travels into the hidden recesses of the subject, exposing everything to my gaze. But this display doesn't give up its secrets easily. Frost inside the window veils the secret within. An hour later, the frost subsides and the warming sun guides me back to this window, now allowing entry to its mystery. A family of beautifully groomed, severed deer heads. The streets of America often wit witness collisions of beauty and ugliness with many of their artifacts representing both simultaneously. The words of historian Joseph J. Ellis still ring true today about the America I have found. He stated that the founding of America was rooted in the coexistence of grace and sin, grandeur and failure, brilliance and blindness. Really beautiful. Right? I pass another window that reads humorously, we sell men used. I photograph it reflexively, but then stand fixated, studying its possible meaning, its possible origins, its maker's intentions. Another case of having to be satisfied with ambiguity and possibility without resolve. My photographs are never laughing at anyone although people often laugh at my pictures. There is a complex struggle there, not easily understood. Another day. I pass another window, its intense mixture of blues draws me in and just as quickly hits me in the gut. As I read the scrawl of handwritten words, they twist my soul. It reads, you suck all the fun out of watching you suffer by complaining too much. I don't have time to study all this fully, 
the crazy mixture of conflicting levels. I must leave it to the experts. I merely collect evidence. But does that mean I'm passive about all this? I can't be, can I? Because I choose what to show and I organize it in a particular way through my sequencing. But I need others to figure it out further, perhaps you. I can only do my part as I wander through this Greek tragedy without end. Freedom of speech is different here. It is mesmerizing and at times terrifying. I continue to walk in another town, still invoking the mindset of the archeologist. A homeless man follows me through the soon to be demolished blocks of abandoned stores. He talks incessantly about the area, what it was then and now, and who was shot in which storefront entry, a confusing cacophony of language making deliriously compelling poetry. He keeps asking me if I want to see his weapon. I quickly look around to see how far I've come and where my van is. I can reach it quickly if I abandon my tripod. He asks again, do you want to see my weapon? But he cannot restrain himself any longer and out it comes. It is a sad looking object that in another setting might be praised as folk art. It shocks me out of my archeologist game, a fork with tines twisted to form a threatening point with oily cardboard carefully wrapped around the handle and held in place with an ancient fraying cord. He is not threatening at all. He is like the master crafts, craftsman, proudly showing off his latest creation. Suddenly he had made me know him when I didn't have time for him. I didn't have time for him, but he made me know him. He was and is at the heart of this abandoned civilization. Perhaps he is even the heart of it. He is the metaphor for this place. It was back in 1989 that I decided to risk everything and change the direction and approach to my work. It was then that I began exploring the world around me more directly using a documentary approach making images like I have been showing you this evening. As I began finding more stimulating subject matter south of the border, my approach shifted to social representation. Only after several years of working in this manner did I begin to realize that not only was I making interesting pictures of America or in America, the combination of images began to reveal that I was also creating a portrait of America. If I had started out trying to do such an incredible thing, I would have abandoned it soon after, saying it was a ridiculous idea, too large, impossible. But here I was. The evidence of my photographs demonstrated that I was photographing better than I actually knew. After about eight years working in America exclusively, broad themes began to emerge. Loss, hope, fear, and desire. Later in his brilliant introduction to Shards of America, David Harris described these themes further, listing them with greater clarity. Quote, traditional family values, relationships between men and women, religious and community standards, patriotism, consumerism, censorship, a simmering violence and a nostalgia for a simpler past coupled with a desire for a less complicated present. When I heard the great photographer Robert Frank say that his work was personal and therefore various facets of American life and society had been ignored, it struck a chord. I thought something similar about my own work. It too is personal. I cannot hope to deal with all aspects of a subject of this scale. I can only speak about those things that have drawn me in. America provided a vehicle through which I could also speak broadly about my world, but also 
more specifically about the human condition, what it is to be human with all our frailties. Mark Twain, Twain wrote, there is an overriding sadness in the subject matter I choose, a sadness that I don't fully understand. Within my work, there is also such sadness. And although I understand it, much of it, like Twain, I don't fully understand. In my books, mixing with this sadness is a delicate trace of hope. The interaction of the two, that is of sadness and hope, is often propelled by irony. Irony is everywhere I look. Things say one thing, but mean another. I think of sequencing as the orchestration of meaning in order to create a more dynamic interplay between themes. I intersplice them throughout extended sequences. While a commingling advances, I allow each theme to develop at its own pace. To craft pairs and sequences of images, this orchestration often utilizes Sekula's relationship headings, anchoring, contradicting, contradicting, reinforcing, subverting, complementing. Pairing and sequencing are highly charged visual processes in which word associations with discoveries play only a part. Visual thinking is vitally important throughout each stage of these processes. Discoveries in the visual realm cannot always be articulated verbally. As Leroy Searle put it, we can and do see more than we can say. Sequencing allows one to work at a high level of creative thinking. I think it's what links the creative writer, the composer, the scientist, the mathematician, the archeologist, and the artist. Their use of experiential data analysis rewards them all with the emergence of unexpected patterns. Shelley summed it up beautifully in his defense of poetry, stating, <clears throat> the poet's language is vitally metaphorical. That is, it marks the before unapprehended relation of things. That's, my that's what my photographs and my sequencing strive to present. The visually, the usual E, usually unapprehended relation of things. Relationships, I seek them out, harnessing them to make meaning. The following summarizes the overriding quality of my experience while photographing in America. Walpole wrote, the man who feels will see life as tragedy. The man who thinks will view it as comedy. For me, it is the interweaving of the feeling and the thinking and the humorous and the tragic that has allowed me to make this work and which forms its foundation. What I hope for in response to my books was summed up in this quote by Robert Frank. When people look at my pictures, I want them to feel the way they do when they want to read a line of a poem twice. In the days of rapid fire tweeting, the act of contemplating a picture for a considerable time seems distant, a foreign idea and the act of doing it without the intrusion of verbal articulation and explanation is almost unheard of. I understand that in order to share our experiences with each other, we need to put words to our experiences, but first we need to give ourselves the visual thinking time necessary to create an internal experience worth sharing. I hope when you examine my book, my books, you will have enough time to approach my work in this way. Thank you very much. I guess I'm going right into introducing Matt Waples. Matt has done an excellent job curating this exhibit and his essay is outstanding. Thank you, Matt, for setting your curation bar 
so high and being so professional about every aspect of the exhibit. Matt is an excellent photographer in his own right and has exhibited in Europe, Canada, and the United States. He is also half American, which leads to many worthwhile informed discussions. He is currently teaching at Trent University, where students are lucky to have him. Hopefully Trump, Trent, <laughs> did I call it Trump? Oh my God. Hopefully Trent will wake up and offer him a tenured track position soon as they should. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and curator of the exhibit, Matt Waples. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Phil. It's always a pleasure to listen to you talk about your work. Uh, I guess I just wanna start off and say thank you to everyone at Gallery X, the whole team. You guys made this a wonderful experience. It was a joy working with you. The online exhibition looks excellent. I don't think we could have asked for anything better. Um, so let me switch myself off into my sharing here. And I just have a few pictures from the uh, exhibition that I feel like I would have up while I'm reading this essay. So what on earth are you doing? America is neither dream nor reality. It is a hyper-reality. It is a hyper-reality because it is a utopia which has behaved from the very beginning as though it were already achieved. Everything here is real and pragmatic, and yet it is all the stuff of dreams too. It may be that the truth of America can only seen, be seen by a European, or in this case, a Canadian, since he alone will discover here the perfect simulacrum, that of the imminence and material transcription of all values. The Americans, for their part, have no sense of simulation. They are themselves simulation in its most developed state, but they have no language in which to describe it, since they themselves are the model. As a result, they are the ideal material for an analysis of all the possible variants of the modern world. No more and no less, in fact, than were primitive societies in their day. The same mythical and analytic excitement that made us look towards those earlier societies today impels us to look in the direction of America with the same passion and the same prejudices. This is a quote from Jean Baudrillard's book, America, a book that I read after I first met Phil. And while reading the book, I thought about Phil's pictures. And then when I look at Phil's pictures, sometimes I think about that book. To continue on, the work selected here are just a sliver of Phil's, Phil Bergerson's vast body of work. He photographs storefronts and services that show a palimpsest-like nature, services worked and reworked over time by different authors for different reasons. Some of these surfaces are produced for commercial purposes, while others are community mural projects or even the intrusion of vandals. There exists between these interventions a richness of information and affect that is a pleasure to discover by us as viewers, sifting through the layers of trauma, celebration, hope, and despair. The stories latent in this selection oscillate from broken idealisms to burgeoning hope, between services worked over time and new services overwriting the old. Alongside the messages imprinted in the walls and city, uh, sorry, imprinted in the walls of city centers, a spatial nostalgia is inscribed in the murals of nature, painted over nature lost. The images of enclosure hint at the pre-enclosed commons the before America that sits in the depths of the American psyche. These photographs are slices out of the surface of the multifaceted American image, artifacts or shards as Phil's book titles point towards. One photograph, uh, one photograph reads, we meet by accident in place of signage that could just as easily read rooms for rent, free Wi-Fi, or maybe in 1998, free cable TV. This sign itself could be the work of an artist, but it functions as an allegory in Phil's photography. Phil does not alter the situations he photographs beyond where he places the frame of the camera. 
Each of these images is a discovery by chance, by accident. Phil uses the camera as a tool in which to mediate the world around him as it comes. He may meet these places by accident, but the resulting images and selections produce intentional ironies and metaphors that dig to the depths of his subject, America. Why Phil was interested in America was a bit of a mystery to me at first. As an American myself, it felt a bit voyeuristic. However, I will never forget moving from the US to Canada and how I felt like a voyeur, an outsider, looking into a culture and place I did not quite understand. The references to Canadian media and history evaded me for years, and at times they still do. But in this confusion, I was able to see the differences more clearly between Canada and the US. I looked at Canada as Phil looked at the US with a curiosity and desire to learn. Anyone who has traveled south or north of the border will likely feel the difference between the two countries, but this change can only make your sight clearer. Between this heightened perception and the decade-long commitment to his work, Phil's photographs reveal an outsider looking into another world, but with a, with a confidence in this potential discomfort that produces startling, occasionally comical or frightening, but always empathetic relationships. I was just a student when I met Phil in the scanning lab at Ryerson University. He looked at me intently and asked what I was working on. I was scanning some medium format film and I was happy to talk about it with this man that at the time I knew nothing about. I began working with Phil over the course of the next year, listening carefully to his stories and looking even more closely at the images we worked on. There was a philosophical quality to the images that Phil made, that is to say, a love of learning. Some of his images are deceptively simple. What on earth are you doing? Reads a green sign off the side of a highway. This is a good question and one that can be seen in a multitude of ways. What on earth is Phil doing with his camera? What are we doing looking at this photograph? What are we doing on and to earth? What are we doing to ourselves? our collective well-being, or to our society and to our collective well-being. I say this image is simple for a reason, or deceptively simple for a reason. What is the difference between, between seeing this sign in person versus seeing it in this photograph? We glance at roadside signs and interventions in passing, but then we drive off, perhaps never to think of it again. A later image that reads, shelter, a neon tubing over a hand-painted American flag exhibits a similar simple framework in which we can read out a variety of questions. Is America a shelter? And if, so, and if so, a shelter for whom and when? There's a certain prescience to Phil's work, like the image of a New York newsstand in July 2001, a newspaper documenting the child custody scandal that plagued Rudy Giuliani while he was mayor of New York City is nested next to a headline reading war chant under the pornographic magazine surrounding it. There was no way of Phil knowing what would happen in the months or years to come, but this image documents the varied history of a public figure about to be caught in a pivotal moment, moment in American history. Rudy Giuliani shifted from a public dunce to a national hero following 9-11 and finally to a menace nearly two decades later while the war in Afghanistan has just now reached its end. The attention span of partisan politics may be brief, but the camera is here to remind us, remind us of what was when we are considering what is happening now. One of the irreplaceable functions of art and specifically photography is the ability to look back, to lens the current moment with one from the past. Another image taken in 2018 exhibits a similar, though divergent temporality, surface and temporality. The words love, 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 written on painted bricks with a scrawling, you have betrayed me, America, sit next to an old advertisement that features a face off to the side whose gaze is just short of the frame. The summer of 2020 made this sentiment vivid across the country. 
How many have you betrayed America and for how long? This image lives in the hope that America has for itself, but reveals the angst underneath this projected surface. These are some of the opportunities we receive from looking at Phil's work. There is no dogma to Phil's lensing and his work is not partisan, but his photographs are deeply empathetic, specific and profound. There's a need to read diffractively with Phil's work, to look for overlaps and intersections of similarity and difference to find meaning, to look for where the ripples in the water cross one another. This is something I've thought about while engaging with Phil's work over the last seven years. He can find moments of contradiction in the surface of real American aesthetics. These are not the images of America that we see through the backlit screens in our living rooms and pockets. The situations Phil photographs are the inscriptions on the walls of a cave. These images are quiet. They do not come with headlines or captions, just the location and date. We as viewers do the work of decoding the information within these images. This is not to say the old cliche of, he just makes the work, it's the viewer's job to interpret. As Phil exhibits a rare perspicacity within these images, he is eminently aware of what the camera does, what the act of photographing, sequencing, and exhibiting does, how images massage us. Look closely and you can, find an, you can find an education in the act of looking and thinking through Phil's work. I know that I have. While he no longer teaches at Ryerson, he has never relinquished photography's ability to teach us about the world, about ourselves, or about how we look at the world. Phil's photographs may not contain any people, but they are all about people and the mediated social fabric of our world where action and agony go endlessly round in circles. So that covers my essay. It was quite a pleasure to sit down. It was the first opportunity I had to really sit down and write about Phil's work. Uh, like I said in this uh, in reading, I met Phil when I was a student. He took me on as an assistant and then we worked for a few years together and then we had a break. And then a few years later, uh, we were kind of picked up and moving again. Uh, just the other thing about when I met Phil, Phil had already retired at Ryerson, so I never got to experience Phil as the professor, but I did get to experience Phil as the artist in action, and this in and of itself was a massive learning experience for me. So thank you all very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed both the pictures and the words that it came from both Phil and myself. I'm wondering, uh, first of all, if, if those of you that have not uh, done many Zoom meetings over the past uh, two years feel the strange and heavy silence of applause over a Zoom call. It's, uh, it's, it's so much different than it normally would be. I would invite you all at this time to unmute and give this man some applause for his amazing work. <laughs> uh, oh, you're doing things, right? Uh, I'm wondering uh, if anyone has any questions or well, thoughts uh, for Bill or for Matt. Least, but I can't picture her off in two guys. These guys are pros. <laughs> There's definitely some of us. What do you mean? And, and so it is they, when you open up the interest in seeing, but nothing else is on fire. I assume you let me argue that because my cop friend asked me at the post. I'm going to mute people now. I imagine it's still confidential. <laughs> look at my look at that. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> ain't like grand. You know I. Um, am I on there? You are. I, 
I uh, realize every time I do one of these things that I I go and uh, <coughs> type my, uh, catch myself by uh, reading it quickly to get through it several times to fix things and do whatever. I did that took me what I must have done at least 50 minutes more maybe. Sorry for that. I, I thought I was in the 40 outside 40 minutes, you know, interesting how that happens. Uh, in the chat, Lynn says amazing insights into the human condition, which is universal and son of a photographer enjoying his scotch and his cigar on his deck says beautiful essay, Matt. Uh, Louise says, I found this presentation to be very moving and profound, especially during these COVID times. I loved the words as much as the photos. And I would add to Louise's thought, the, uh, the format of our evening together, uh, a virtual opening for a virtual gallery uh, you know, while we're watching, uh, looking at these, uh, these images are fascinating, fascinating together. Matt's muted. He's talking <laughs> I was just going to say, make sure to actually look at the exhibition online because then you're not looking at it through the interface of Zoom. Yeah. Even, the pictures are even better. The quality, uh, I was just going to say that, that the coolness of the images reduce the impact of them compared to the actual exhibition that has uh, uh, it of a different, uh, different level of quality. Good. Can I wanted I, to say you're, that when, Matt, when you're working with me, can I mute you like this? I mean, because I want to take this with me. I don't know if to get you a special remote and you can just mute me. <laughs> well, if you want to have me along, I can mute him anytime you'd there like. You okay. Figured it out. <laughs> well done, Matt. Sorry, Rain, you were saying something. Well, I was just going to say this has been a very moving, very moving presentation and uh, and a little bit of insight as to where you've been and, and how you're looking at the world. And uh, I, I just can't help but um, learn uh, uh, for myself too, you know, when you stop and, and gaze, you know, through, through a, a horizon, you've got this amazing ability to pick, you know, uh, uh, that, that most profound uh, image that, that makes us uh, be wowed by, by the human condition. Um, I have no questions at this point because I'm just, uh, I, I'm going to have to absorb and uh, review and go and look at your show again and again. But thank you for, uh, for showing us an, a, a really unique way of stopping to look at the world. Thank you. I think the, uh, you know, where I started this talk with the uh, idea of, um, I'll think of the word any minute now. What is the first word that I wanted to address to young people? It wasn't collaboration, it was um, opportunity. Yes. You see, this is, this is funny for Matt and I, we could easily say, this is like any of the things we do, everything we do. It can be just, uh, we can say it's not worth it, not worth the effort to do certain things. But if you hold your own internal drive, uh, everything's worth doing. It's an opportunity to do something. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad I had this opportunity and, uh, and was able to dig deeper. And there's Matt, digging so deep for the uh, the writing that he did. Bravo, man. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I guess this would go to uh, both Phil and Matt. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing both your perspectives. Um, Phil, while you were talking, you, were, you had uh, sort of invited uh, people to um, do some work with uh, your work. And, and sort of uh, take it forward somehow. Um, while I'm looking at it, uh, it, it it's, it's almost um, as if it comes across as a diary and it has very um, 
a very present tone, but looking forward, do you have any sort of, uh, maybe, maybe you can articulate for us a little bit of what, uh, what are the implications of a, a forward-looking interpretation of how this gets translated as time goes on? Yeah, I think that, uh, that is what I'm happiest about. Just imagine how many photographs I've made. Which one are we wearing here? Um, I was so fortunate that the, um, the archive, I think they call it the Library and Archive now, but it's the Archive of Canada. Took my, uh, I just had a blowout in my room here. Um, they um, took my entire oeuvre, all my negatives, all my contact sheets, uh, 450 prints, and they're now sitting in the archive and they will be there uh, forever and being taken care of. And so what I've learned is when you're working on something like this, remember I was doing some different things, manipulated imagery, painting all kinds of other things before I turned to try and make another uh, kind of move in terms of uh, what, it, what to make, how to make it. Um, so once I got into it a certain period of time, I realized, oh, I'm actually making something and it's very hard for others to see it because they can't look at enough pictures, but I've made so many pictures and now they're in so many places, the National Gallery and other places that they're accumulating an, an import in terms of speaking about a particular place at a particular time. And then because it is so specific like that, we can reflect on who we are as Canadians also even looking at it. So I, I'm just so happy. Um, when I took students over to Europe and uh, I was, they were in the Bibliothèque Nationale looking at uh, uh, Ache, uh, famous photographer Ache, photographs of Paris. And then you would see another person, both of them hired by the, the uh, government to photograph almost the same streets. And you'll see Ache with that little nuance of otherness in the way that he's approaching it, understanding what is behind it, um, just made such a powerful kind of uh, work. And I realized he would be crazy also as he's in his time trying to talk to all these different museums, I read his letters, trying to get them to take his archive. And of course they weren't interested. And, and now, uh, obviously, they, they would be. Um, but I, I just realized there is something significant in that archive that uh, I will never know. In 50 years, it'll have some greater resonance of a different type. And the beauty of it, I find always in exhibitions. I love when um, a mother and daughter, you know, a 12 year old daughter and a mother uh, come into the gallery and they're looking around and they start having this conversation. And then there gets to be this argument between the two, each of them having an equal part in looking at my photograph and reviewing it and thinking about what it means and then being able to have a dialogue about it. Uh, so they are, because of the nature of them, the way I have made them, they're accessible to people, even to kids. And, and uh, oh, I, I just thought that that photograph that we keep talking about, um, I'll think of that. What is the title of this exhibit, guys? It's a test. What on earth are you doing? Thank you. Jesus. I don't know why my wife stays with me in this condition. Um, what on earth are you doing? I had three little kids, little kids come up in the gallery and they told me they want to talk to me about this picture. They want to pull me over there and talk to me about the picture. And they said, I think this is the, this is the most interesting one. And I said, well, well, why? What is so interesting about it? He says, well, that, that isn't really a sign that somebody has made with their hand. It's a machine has made that. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a machine made duplicate of a real kind of sign, but it's not real. 
and it has this other meaning inside. And these little kids were picking up on the condition of the object and what it was actually saying. You, you don't have uh, better days than that, I'll tell you. Sure. Fascinating. Yeah, there's, I, I always have questions around motive when I look at Phil's photographs. Not Phil's motive, but the motive of the people that have put together whatever it is that Phil is photographing. Like that, what on earth are you doing sign? I would love to know who made that sign, why they made that sign, and why they put it exactly where they did. So we're just kind of filled with all these questions looking into really any of these photographs. And sometimes, well, I think I said in the middle there somewhere, see people, uh, just as I was, I photograph better than I know until later. And people do things without understanding what they're actually expressing. And uh, it isn't a, a shortcoming of the thing. It is just the way it is. Things are made and they have lives of their own. And especially as I take it and place it in conjunction with other pictures. We're going to tell everybody who didn't come that they really missed out on something, eh? They did. Matt, and Matt, your essay was superb. It really, truly was superb. Thank you. Seven years in the making. <laughs> I guess I have a, if I have, can I interject with a question? I, I get to ask Phil questions whenever I want. So I guess I should ask, I can ask him a public question too. Um, so in this exhibition, there's almost two, I don't know if I'd call them different bodies of work, but ones that almost feel like they're different solely based on the shape of the pictures themselves. Mm. During the time when we were working together was also the time in which you switched from shooting on film cameras, on a square format camera, to shooting rectangularly on the digital camera. I, I, knew, you, I knew you would protect me. That's why I decided I'd make Exactly, I'm always there. You can call me out in the field. Like, what is this setting do? And I'm there for you. I'll have the manual up on the screen and we'll figure it out. But I guess my question would be, uh, I think I've heard you speak about this, but I think other people might be interested. Did that create a shift in how you went about making photographs? Yes, I'm still trying to figure it out what happens because just imagine you're photographing any of the things you saw, the square pictures. Uh, the square picture has, uh, the square format has a, a limitation in what you can do in terms of allowing for more stuff on the sides to come in. In other words, you're looking at something and you want more in the sides to be in the frame so that it can interact with what is there. But as you pull back to include all that, the foreground and the uh, often the sky becomes so big in the picture that it ruins uh, what's going on. So I became a master of making dynamic pictures inside this crazy frame of a square. Mm -hmm. And all the way through it, I thought, what am I doing? This is so hard compared to working with a rectangle, working with a square all the time. But because I was accumulating a lot of pictures and I wanted to make books, it's very hard to go from a rectangle to a, to a uh, from a square to a rectangle and back and forth as you're making sequences in a, in a book. So it wasn't until I felt confident that I could shift and then make a large enough body of work that would dovetail with the first work um, that I that I switched. But it, as soon as I did that, it suddenly, you know, look at that guy with the with the uh, the cowboy with the bag. Uh, for instance, uh, this, I have to figure out, okay, how do I put this into a frame? I could actually photograph that in a square, but the dynamics of including the rest, so there's this void stuff becomes uh, very important and, uh, uh, and allowed me to create spatial queuing that was, you know, for the rest of you, you've been doing this all your life. I'm all excited. I'm free. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm not, not having the square and I can include the thing that's around the corner and I can do this, that, and the other. It, uh, it, it makes, uh, it, it fills you a little bit too much with confidence because you think, oh, well, now I can shoot anything. But of course you can't because it is that difficult. Mm -hmm.
this is the uh, this what you're showing here um, is the the exhibition grid, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So you can if you if you just notice that the character of all of the pictures are much warmer. And as a result, the the warmer colors in them make for a much more interesting three dimensional feel to them. I mean, look at the what on earth are you doing that took forever to print into the picture that little feeling of red against that green to make it a little more dynamic color wise. And then when you when you put it into this video and it submerges the, the color, it's uh, it's hard for me to look at given how much time I've spent making a print another way. But fortunately I work with people who are just as crazy as I am in terms of printing. Like I'm sitting with a, a, a printer because it's easier to work with him than I, Dimitri. And uh, we're just like a couple of little kids happy little guys thinking we just changed this magenta a little bit and look at what's going to happen and we jump up and down yeah, which is oh sorry why it's so, gonna... so great being an artist we just have a lot of fun i was going to bring that up you you mentioned it briefly this is more of a comment than a question i guess but you mentioned briefly and uh, the work that you were doing when you were younger before you ended up on this into this vein of your subject being America and going into the States and making more photographs. I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of Phil's early work and a lot of it has to do with printmaking. And as right behind Phil, you see paintings. Those are your paintings, correct? If I remember correctly. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting to me when I look at your work, I'm able to see just how much care goes into how you fill a frame. Like you were talking about the difference in the square and the rectangle, but then also in how that image is kind of worked and reworked to make the final print. And even these digital images are not prints, but these are still works that have been edited over and over again, very specifically. One little hint of red here, a hint of magenta here. So it's really a kind of, um, you bring a kind of printmaking expertise into photography, which in a certain sense is almost something that we're starting to lose today because the majority of images don't end up seeing their final form in a print. They end up seeing their final form on a screen. So there is a kind of care about the image that I've always really respected in your work. And yeah. I think you know, that's a, I was so, I have been so lucky in my life um, on so many levels, especially the wife I've got. Is she on there somewhere? Oh, she puts up with a lot. Um, uh, you know, sitting in my, imagine when we're sitting in my car and driving 4,900 different places, She's often sitting beside me with her neck going round and round and round. Now she's getting to be a smarty pants who says, Phil, you, you, missed the, you missed the best thing. It's back here. So she thinks like she's made half of my photographs now of late. Um, but it's, I was so lucky coming into photography when it did. Because if you take film and you process it in a particular way, you can expand and contract the character of the tones that are in this little emulsion. And if you can get that into your head and that's what you want to do, that's what makes you the good printmaker in black and white in the 60s or whatever, is you get in your head the sense of that, that block of silver nitrate or whatever. And you think of what you're doing to it by exposing and, and uh, developing different ways. That I'm still taking with me as I'm looking at the crazy big machinery that Dimitri has that we're trying to mute, move one yellow through this whole thing, you know? And uh, I don't know what people, I don't know what the kids, you're not a kid anymore, by the way. Did you notice that? You're old now. Me? Is that um, me? Yes, I am. That, uh, it, 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 people are missing that ability to perceive what a print is. And therefore, when they make a, a print, they don't understand what it could, what the possibility of it is. They aren't even thinking of whether there is a possibility of it. They're, they're accepting it. It's the same kind of thing of shooting. I, I spoke about it earlier that shooting with your, with your uh, what is that device that you're talking the phone? The phone, iPhone. Yeah, if you shoot with your iPhone, like 
you can do incredible things, but you have to have the mindset of using this as a tool to get through it into whatever it is you're seeing. And there's so many things being made uh, that there isn't even time to contemplate what is there, I believe. And so uh, I don't think I'm just an old fuddy-duddy. I'm realizing that uh, Durer, I have an affinity, I have a connection. Durer and I are like this because I knew when he goes in there to make an etching, he is thinking about all of this the same way I am thinking about all of this. But it's hard with a medium that you're at a distance from in terms of the digital medium. But you have to teach it. You have to teach people to get out of the way they're thinking into that machine. You have to get into that machine with your, with your brain somehow. You know? And uh, I don't know if there's enough. Like I would have to teach that way if I was teaching now. But I don't know if there's enough hours uh, to teach this way uh, now. I have a question for you. It's, uh, it's come through direct message to me. So this is from a mystery person. Uh, there is such a depth of information in the images and I am interested in how you analyze the compositional elements that make a good image. Uh, this is not the, <laughs> you see, someone who doesn't understand the depth of that question. Uh, and I don't know the person, right? So I don't know if it is deep or if it is superficial. It could be either, but I can bring those two things together for them because this is what it's all about. You are standing in one place photographing something. Most of what I have done over my career of making photographs of America had to do with, uh, let's say the first two thirds of my time was to understand that what am I trying to do? I'm trying to bring whatever I'm experiencing there through all this medium manipulation to, and, and when I say manipulation, I mean framing, tone, all those, those things, not using Photoshop to change the people or something. Um, so I kept realizing what I wanna do is present a flat frame, uh, the, a flat plane. That is the picture plane is flat against the picture, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, subject plane. So the subject plane is there and I'm parallel to it with my camera. And I do everything I can to have that happen because then the picture is the closest thing I can bring to a viewer to experience what I'm experiencing. And then to actually start changing that is a much higher, skill level uh and so if you think of the photograph of the the car and uh, um mattress and like that is like i don't get better than that in terms of moving through a space around and up until i find the one position where all of these things can be brought together and readable that is a feat to make that photograph uh, compared to the flat field ones that are the earlier pictures. So it's so if you're a painter, let's say you're coming to the, uh, the, the flat field of the canvas and you're having to decide if you're working on the flat field with what you're applying to it or if you're going to create the illusion of some kind of space. And so, man, I have worked in painting and I realize it is such a wildly wonderful thing to think that you're going to add all these little elements and create space uh, that are is going to be read and stimulating to someone else looking at them. That's all I know. You see, I, you see how excited I, I'm just really, I'm all excited here. Why? Because I miss teaching. I really miss teaching but I can't do that anymore and actually do my work. And uh, uh, that's where you, if you really have something going on, you just wanna share it uh, whenever you can. But I guess now that I'm getting older, I'm just going on and on and on and on. All good information. 
Here's a question for you. And it's not from a mystery person. It's from me. Oh, uh, I, knew it. I know. I know. So you, you've been taking us to school all night. And so I have to ask a question from the perspective of a school teacher. Uh, I've got 35 of the world's best grade eights this year. And I'm teaching them online. And so I'm wondering if I was to give them a message from somebody who's been taking pictures for double the length of time that they've been alive, what, what should I tell them if they were going to go and start taking pictures of their own? The, the first one is the first thing I started talking about. That is opportunities. Like I came, you, you can imagine this happens to me. This is the, the luck of my life. I'm a student at Ryerson. I go to study painting and printmaking to understand what photography is all about. I go to York. I'm almost just about to graduate and that people come from Ryerson and say, hey, do you want to come and teach at Ryerson? I says, what do I know? I'm a student. And, and then uh, my wife said, I think, uh, you know, that would be a good idea since she was working and I wasn't. Uh, so, but I went there and uh, there was so much for me to learn from them. But it is the, when I started uh, uh, teaching, I realized I it sort of had, I had carte blanche. Uh, I could just go and do whatever. There's no money for anything, but I could actually organize things. And I started organizing things. And so that's the thing I would try to get to these young students, uh, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, to say to them, make use of the opportunities and create your own opportunities. Um, like any of those students, they could have a bunch of the greatest artists come online if they started organizing something. Um, okay, but let's go back to just the making of things. I, the way I start all my books is to make pairs. So I have the single photograph and they're all the dynamics of what the relationships are inside the frame. But when I'm going doing the book, it's a big problem trying to harness all this stuff. So what you start with is just diptychs or pairings. So you take any picture and you put it with another one and you try to make something better happen between the two than what either one is like. And so I think that's a great thing for students to do. Not worrying about the greatness of a picture, but to understand what any one picture is like and you understand you can really understand it by looking at the two in my critiques we were never about trying to decide whether this is my uh, in my student critiques critique of students work um it was never about trying to find out whether something was good or bad like that was the last thing we wanted to think about we wanted to understand what it is in front of us what is that thing that you're looking at and as people began to speak about it and were, began to be more articulate about it, what happened is they learned so much that it didn't matter if the things they're looking at were great or bad. It just didn't matter because they've already won by doing it. So the same thing, the kids, they don't have to make great things. They just have to make a relationship and that will blow their minds as to what things they could make in these, uh, these um, pairings. So Phil, it, it seems to me what you're saying there, when you've got uh, the, the kids and they're bringing these images together, that they're in fact learning to create a dialogue between the two images and, yes. right? and, uh, and then bringing another one in and then eventually the flow of what it is they're trying to do. What, mm. what the heck are they doing? You know, like as yeah. your title, you know, what in the world is happening here, <laughs> right? And so yeah. half the it's time you said- On all levels, eh? Well, you said it also earlier, sometimes, you know, uh, well, as a painter and you as a photographer, 
like half the time we don't know what's going on until after the fact. Yes. Right? But even after, it, go ahead. Sorry. No, go on. Well, even after the fact, uh, just think I'm going to Ryer, to York to be a painting major and I never painted before. So I'm coming out of photography and going into painting. And I realized People here didn't know how to talk about images at all. Whereas I had come through photography, I knew how to talk about pictures, what the elements were to talk about it. And so unless you pulled your, your uh, faculty one by one over to your canvas and began to speak to them about it, they were brilliant people, but they weren't teaching like what was happening at Ryerson. And I found that shocking. Um, so what happened was, uh, I realized that I needed to make my paintings in a sy system of thinking. How do I start with a painting? Okay, we'll start with the space in the painting. How would I make a picture that changed the space in the picture? So I'd make, you know, 10 paintings and I get, the <laughs> we'd go to a critique and everybody would say, uh, 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 uh. And that was about it. And everybody would go away. And I'd have to grab the teacher and drag him over to my canvases and say, okay, so this is what I'm trying to do. And then they would go on and on about uh, some system of thinking that a, uh, um, the Turner or somebody would use in the way they were constructing the space with the color. And so, oh, really? Okay, why didn't you say that? And a critique so that everybody can hear this and everybody together collectively are moving forward. So I would, uh, I would, I moved very quickly forward in various kinds of painting because I was, uh, I was trying to understand it. I wasn't trying to make great paintings. I was just trying to understand what it was to paint because at the time I was coming out, it was the late sixties, like photography was like way down here. A sculptor wouldn't even think about it photography being something that he concerned himself with uh, or, or painters, except unless they were enlightened. Uh, and so uh, it was a strange time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes when um, painters are, are working and um, doing all these things, looking at the color composition, texture, what are the elements of design, et cetera, et cetera, they lose touch with what it is they are actually doing. And then it comes to even labeling, titling, it's called a red flower, you know, and that says nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what you're talking about is working very uh, on, a, on a deep level of uh, what is going on with, within yourself, what, what's happening within your psyche as you know where are you going with this and again half the time you don't even know at the time it is yeah. in retrospect you stop and think what happened there yes can, it, I, right? can i tell you something uh, that just occurs to me about that crazy guy uh peter marsh um so i started the first year of a of a of a first year of a school wexford collegiate I was the grade 13 student and he was coming there as the first uh, teacher teaching art. So I had decided in grade 12 going into 13 that I was gonna be a dentist. And so I took all the maths and sciences, dropped anything having to do with art. But there was this guy always moving around <clears throat> in, the, in the hallways. And he was always seemed to be so frenetic and excited about stuff. So I started following him around like a little lap puppy and, uh, and that was Peter. And so he bumps up against me at some point and, and together we went and made a, a sculpture that uh, stands in the place now. Um, somebody else designed it, but th just working with him, the feeling of the energy of this man who was so excited. And I think just like I am right now, um, embarrassingly so, um, that it's, wonderful that you have a passion for something, but that passion will affect so many other people around you, regardless of what you're trying to actually teach in a class, for instance, da, 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 da. doesn't matter about all of that. The, what the student is experiencing is, wow, that guy's excited about something. I, it must be good. 
to be that excited about it. You know? So in, in numbers of ways, since I've been doing this project with you and I'm thinking, reflecting on, on Peter, I'm thinking, I just, and I stopped thinking about being a dentist by the end of that year. And uh, it, I went into, teach, into teacher's college. Um, but I think his enthusiasm, his passion was my passion. And uh, we let her rip. You know? I definitely try and channel a little Phil Bergerson to get my class excited about things. <laughs> It's funny, I think, uh, you know, I get uh, messages from people from Japan and um, Australia and England, former students who are now parents and uh, whatever, but it's when they become a teacher, they suddenly become a teacher later in life and they, they talk to me about that and how I influenced them in becoming a teacher, but I know, and they kind of know. It's again, the enthusiasm, the passion, more than anything they could say about uh, how, to, uh, how to process uh, film or something. Right? And uh, so they were, that's what you're picking up on. And I think the great thing about, uh, the great thing about uh, I'll let that go. Can tell you it's a secret. I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> How are we doing? Ten to nine. Look at you, Michael. Boy, I keep seeing these names popping up. I bet there are people who would like to ask you something. But you know, it's been so thought provoking that it, um, like you almost have to absorb everything for a while and then tomorrow will come and say, I know what I want to ask, Phil. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, such a wonderful, wonderful uh, evening, my gosh. Now, can I tell my wife that I was wonderful or just that it was a wonderful evening? Because you I can tell her you were wonderful. Okay, that's I, <laughs> and, I, I, it, I, and it was a wonderful okay, evening. Okay, both of them. I can use those then. That's good. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is uh, like just think of us. Like I'm just looking at even, we'll include Michael, who hasn't said a thing up there. I can only I can see five of you. And uh, just think of how much work we have done for this event. It's, it's mind blowing, blowing how much time and effort it takes to do anything like this. And we're all doing it for free. Why? Because we love this, uh, we love the p possibility. It is so wonderful to think of the possibility of um, a gallery in Scarborough where there are so many artists uh, floating around without understanding um, that they exist there. You know? But that, that's a long haul from now, but it's the beginning right now as you're setting this up. Can I ask a question, Uncle Phil? <laughs> oh, God, where the <laughs> hell did you come from? There's a, the, on the next page. I stopped being a professor uh, uh, Professor Bergerson, and now there is my niece, Professor Bergerson, <laughs> with my picture on the wall back there. My God. Yes, I had to make sure you'll, that was. You'll hang in anything. Uh, I have a question. So, so one thing, first of all, was the best advice you gave me about teaching was to share your enthusiasm, and that's uh, held me in good stead. So I appreciate that. The thing, it's I, only I'm only good for one shot because I say the same things over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, but it's good advice, so it's good. Um, <laughs> I was just curious about the process. So this is a non-artist uh, question um, about the process. So you talk about when you're in the moment and then how you reflect on things afterwards. What do you do in the planning up? Like how, how do you plan your next van trip with Auntie Diane? How do you think about that? What, you know, what I've heard so far is that you have a skill set, a mindset, 
and a set of tools that you go out with and that's when you turn everything on but what gets you excited about the next trip and how do you how do you think about planning that <laughs> this is why i'm so proud of you <laughs> you can take all of that stuff and summarize it very nicely i can just imagine your students um A lot of it now is, if if we're in a van going out there, it's uh, I'll say, okay, we're going, uh, we're going to Texas, and Diane would say, okay, and she'd get in the thing, and away we go. But then we would see there's tornadoes there, so we we turn, we go somewhere else, we do something else. It's uh, it's like that. We can easily uh, uh, shift what we're doing because I'm confident now. I can find something almost anywhere because it's a matter of being able to look with the tools that you have, the, with the filters that I've grown uh, to look into things and you find something that you are not expecting. So it's just, uh, it's just a lot of fun um, doing that. And I, uh, so sometimes we, we, or I fly into Denver or something and then I'll do, I'll figure if I got two weeks, I'll do a large circle uh, around all the little towns that I could get to in that full circle and get back into a, a fly home. So um, now there is another complication of because I'm starting to work with rectangles and I'm also, something is shifting in the work. Um, and even though I've had exhibitions of it and it's in the book already, um, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to understand what am I doing? I'm like, I'm new again to something because I'm finding I'm, I'm, it may be my age and the fact that I have all this experience that I'm starting to stop and contemplate things that I otherwise wouldn't and that it has some human depth of experience in that thing I'm photographing. And I try to figure out how to photograph that to convey that sense of something deeper in what it is to be human. And those don't come around all the time. So you might have one picture like it in a uh, um, long time. Uh, you have my book, so it's one of the, uh, one of the pictures of a, uh, a little alcove that has a couple of chairs in it and it has some balustrades and a, and a, a sign saying, uh, beware of the dogs. And it's just a very simple image. But all I think about in that photograph is how calm and contemplative it must be for those people to sit there on these funny little wire chairs, but it's like a little enclave. It's you against the world and nobody can come into this little space that you've got and it's all deteriorating and everything, but it, and the light on it is like, I'm, I'm standing out with the cars traveling all around me and I got dogs inside trying to kill me and I'm trying to catch the four seconds of light left because it was incredible sweeping across this thing. So uh, those are becoming larger missions. Um, and I, I think in the last set of things I photographed, I photographed a, uh, somebody who repairs cars has decided what they want on the outside of their place is a door of a car stuck on the thing and then it's this beautiful green and the, and the red around it. It's like, what is happening inside that person? Because they have made this incredible thing. Uh, do they know it? Um, how much do they know about what is there? But they love it. Like you can't do that without just loving it. But they don't know necessarily what they're loving. And then I'm going there and realizing I love, you know, it's like my brain into his brain or her brain. Uh, experiencing this, you know. Mm -hmm. That is, this is very kind of you to come to another one of these sessions. This is, this has been absolutely wonderful. And um, I just wanted to say something on behalf of Peter Marsh, um, who could not be here this evening. Um, he will be thrilled to be able to watch uh, this recording afterwards. And uh, he was so excited about this exhibition, Phil, as you know. And 
I want to thank Peter for introducing us to you. Um, and, uh, and thank you to Peter for all the things that he has done too for Gallery X. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll, uh, I should get about 25 cents from him if he's going to watch the video though. <laughs> maybe, maybe 25, 30 cents. <laughs> no, absolutely wonderful. And, uh, Every, if there are any other questions that anyone might have for, for Phil or anything else you want to say, Phil, and we're about uh, nine o'clock. And uh, it's, it's hard to say. You know, I, you know, something that just occurred to me today, because I just wrote some of the stuff today for the first time, I'm always trying to find how am I thinking of things. And there was lots I chopped out just at the end. I realized I was going so long. Um, that that idea of arriving, you know, I know I've arrived at something. I think a number of you have realized you have arrived at what you are doing too. Um, and nobody can take it away from you. And, and so you, you can be cheerful in the midst of insanity, in, in the midst of stupid people saying stupid things to you. Nobody can take away from you, this beautiful kernel that you have inside you that uh, you have developed over all these years. And uh, you should revel in that and uh, appreciate that you have been able to uh, develop that. But sometimes, I, I, because I have to make these speeches all the time, um, I have realized that for me. But I think a lot of people don't have that opportunity and therefore aren't self-reflexive or, or thinking internally about that. And it's so worthwhile to do it, especially as you're going into meetings. I never have meetings. Uh, you all have meetings and boy, you've got to protect yourself from the inner core and help those people who are cuckoo in that, those meetings. Help them. And Send now I, I, sorry, Phil, go ahead. Send me all their numbers. I'll call them. <laughs> and, and you are delightful. And thank you so much for uh, making this all work. Um, and I love the way you talk about your students, because that means that uh, they're turning you on and you're turning them on. And it's, that's all you, you won't do. be thanking me when they start emailing you, Phil. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens, too. All right, my friends, it is nine o'clock. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, our recording of this will be up uh, in due course on the Gallery X YouTube. And uh, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. I don't know why I'm looking so magenta, but oh well. <laughs>